The frustration that I have with the wellness industry is that it makes it more complicated than it needs to be. Like ultimately, what we're fundamentally talking about and trying to encourage people to do is eat less ultra processed food, cook more and use more simple fresh ingredients, you know, and not to be too kind of generalist, but like as their grandparents or great grandparents would have done it. It's almost just like going back to absolute basics. And I think one of the challenges that you have is obviously like these big debates and should, you know, the keto diet and these trends coming out of America and all these, yeah, gluten-free and dairy-free and all these different topics that you could talk about. Ultimately, like it just starts to muddy the water and it starts to make it quite confusing. Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Christian Guru Murphy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week does have some big ideas and they were very directly shaped by her own life experience. Ella Mills is a food writer, sort of blogger originally, um, and businesswoman and uh, the, the face of Deliciously Ella which is the range of foods that you'll see in all sorts of um, supermarkets now, and a best-selling author. Her book about healthy eating, plant-based eating, was a huge bestseller uh, about 10 years ago. And she has since published various follow-ups, and her new one is called Healthy Made Simple. Welcome. Thank you so much. And Healthy Made Simple, I mean, I suppose the idea behind it is that we don't have a lot of time in our lives, especially at your stage in life when you're mother of young children, and you need to do it all a bit more quickly. That's it, exactly. I think so many of us, over the last 10 years, as you said, since the first book, cookbook came out and since I changed my diet, we've had this increased understanding about the food that we're eating and the impact that it has on us. And so many people have such good intentions to try and change the way they're eating because they know that so much of what they're eating maybe isn't giving them the best health. But actually doing that in reality when you've got a busy job, you've got other responsibilities is very different. And so the aim with this book was really to break that down. It's 30 minute meals, it's under 10 ingredients. It's how can you take the intention and I guess translate it into something that feels plausible after work. Right, sum up what, do you, what the intention is. What's the intention about now? Yeah, look, for me, it's quite simple. I, I want to show people how to eat real food again. It's more plants for more people, more of the time. And that's not about becoming 100% plant-based. That's not about changing every part of your diet today. But about two thirds of our calories currently are from ultra processed food. We know the impact that's having on us. And the only way to change that is by showing people that there's a different way to eat, there's a different way to cook. And so it's all about putting plants on the map in a way that is simple and that is delicious. So are you a campaigner? Are you, are you a, I think somebody who wants to change the world? That is definitely step two, I think, of my career. That's, that's what I hope I'm stepping into now. I think I've yeah, been doing this for, gosh, almost 12 years now. And early on, it was very much about my own experience. And I never intended to start a business. I never intended to create this community. It was a very personal project to teach myself to cook after a period of ill health. It was then really about the kind of immediate community, particularly because, as I said, the world has changed so much in the last decade. You know, when I first started doing this, there was still, and it feels strange to say it today, almost a skepticism that there was a link between what you ate and your health. And obviously now we have firmly kind of debunked that and that's very, very clear. So now it feels like the time to be able to really step forward and say, no, let's, let's change the world. Let's change the way that we eat. We need it now more than ever. Um, and still so many people really um, struggling with making those changes. Now, for, for you personally, it was about health originally. Um, you had a very serious illness. Um, you know, is, is that still the primary driver that, that plant-based food and thinking about intolerances and all of those sorts of things is really the, the way to a healthier life? I think, you know, a plant-rich diet is a really powerful unlocker of health. And again, there is so much evidence to show that. And that's not, as I said, about trying to persuade everyone that they should be 100% plant-based. And I kind of, maybe controversially to some people, I, I don't actually believe that. I think you need to find the right balance for you and what suits you. But what I think is unequivocal is that we need to move to a predominantly whole food diet in which we are putting ingredients like broccoli and chickpeas in the center of our plates. And so that's what all the recipes are about. Why? 
Why? Because it's good for every aspect of our health. Obviously, it's amazing for our gut health. We know we should be eating about 30 different plant-based foods a week. We're getting about half the fiber that we need at the moment. We know how intrinsic our gut health is to every other part of our health. We know how important it is to our mental health. We know how important a healthy diet is for our blood pressure, for reducing risk of type 2 diabetes, for so many different types of cancers, for so many of the lifestyle-related diseases which have just mounted and mounted in the last few decades. I mean, I think I read this morning in the 1950s, 1% of the population of the UK were obese. The change that we've seen in the food landscape in the last 70 years or so has completely changed our health. And we're seeing that now more than ever. And we can't afford on a practical basis for the NHS to keep going that way. But also, and I think this is what makes me feel so strongly on a personal level about it. I have been there in that place where you feel so dark, you feel so depressed because your health has completely collapsed. And for so many people, they don't have to feel that way. Now, it's not as simple as just saying to someone, look, buy this cookbook and make broccoli for dinner. There are so many social, economic factors that play into this. And, and, you know, look, ultimately, the problem is, is that per calorie, a lot of deeply ultra processed food that is so bad for us is cheaper and so that requires so much change in order to fundamentally shift the landscape but we do need to start to do that and I think that the personal experience that I've had in feeling so ill and so many bodily functions not working creates this very deeply personal drive to help other people not feel that way if possible. So, so just tell us a little bit about that. I mean, you, you've written about it and you've spoken about it at length, but for those people who haven't heard the story, you were, you were at university and you fell ill out of the blue. Yes, exactly. So in 2011, um, I was a student, I was at university and really out of nowhere, I got very, very ill. So I spent the rest of that year in our hospital. We saw neurologists and endocrinologists and gastroenterologists. I had MRIs, ultrasounds, colonoscopies, cystoscopies, like swallowed cameras, you name it. I tried it basically while people tried to get to the bottom of what was going on. And eventually I was diagnosed the condition that um, was an impairment of the functioning of my autonomic nervous system and a few other secondary conditions as well. But it looked a little bit like long COVID in the sense of nothing really worked, no one really knew why, and no one really knew what to do about it. And so I couldn't regulate my heart rate, my digestion. I had very severe chronic fatigue, so I would sleep for up to like 18 hours a day had brain fog, I had pain, I had three years of continuous infection, so I never went longer than 48 hours without antibiotics. I would have to go into hospital for antibiotic drips. Um, I looked more pregnant at that point than I did when I was about seven months pregnant with my daughter. Um, So my body just wasn't working. And I was on about up to 25 different medications a day at my peak, and no one promised they would work. They're all repurposed from other conditions. And it was when it became clear that the last one that I was trying wasn't working. And I had all sorts of side effects from some, and you know, I'd got 5% better here, 10% better here, but nothing more than that. And I was never gonna be able to live a normal life, get a job, live independently with the health that I had at that point. And my mental health was in a very, very dark place as well. I was really suffering from depression. And um, that was my moment of thinking, I think it was in hitting my absolute rock bottom and it was that realization of either I don't really see the point of being here anymore or I've got to get myself out of this. And that was what led me to start researching. And there was this thread of people had changed the way they were eating. And ultimately they were going back to how we used to eat 150 years ago, just simple food and it had completely changed their life. And I started going into supermarkets and turning over the back of packets and thinking, okay, this simple sandwich actually has 32, 40 different ingredients. And I was looking at and thinking, I don't even know what any of these are. And that is making up the bulk of my diet. And that is the reality for so many of us today. Um, of and, processed foods. Well, ultra processed, ultra processed food, foods. where you, th- these aren't anything you'd ever have in your kitchen cupboards and thinking, okay, I'm not going to eat any of these anymore. And then I'm going to teach myself to cook and I'm going to cook simple plant-based food that puts, as I said, these ingredients that we know have so many health benefits like chickpeas, like all these beans and vegetables, et cetera, in the center of my plate. And it wasn't, you know, overnight. And I'm always the first person to say that it took me sort of two years to really regain my health and it took me almost three years to come off all my medication and to be well enough to do that. But I, I have been off it ever since. And, and what do you believe and what do the doctors say about the relationship between your diet and getting better? Well, at you know, that is, point, it as, is it as simple as saying you changed the way you ate and you got better? Yes, I think fundamentally it is. You know, and we see that time and time again, the number of conditions that you can improve or at least reduce the symptoms of by changing the way that we eat. And it's, you know, we've have increasing acceptance of it, but it is 
it is a hard thing to hear. And I found it really difficult when I was looking at my diet and thinking, wait a second, so actually all of these things that are my staples I need to get rid of. And when you start looking at the ingredients in what are your kind of daily yeah, eats, it, it is challenging. And I think we also live in such a different ecosystem than it's almost impossible to eat well. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges. And certainly for me now, that's one of the biggest drivers. I think we can give people as many recipes as possible. We can show you that, yes, you can put something delicious that has healthy ingredients on in the table in 15, 20 minutes. But unless we fundamentally, and this is obviously a collective thing that's you know across industries, across government, and, um, unless we actually change the food landscape so that when you go out to get your lunch, you have options that are genuinely healthy. And at the moment, if you go into most supermarkets, if you look at the meal deals, et cetera, the ingredients are terrible. We know those things are actively making us ill. Um, and so that's sort of the, I guess, the two pronged ambition is to give people the resources. So when you are prompted to start to make these changes, you have the resources to do it in a way that is delicious so it does feel sustainable. But equally, I think, you know, over the last six years, we've launched over 100 food products and we have done that without using a single emulsifier preservatives to let stabilizer flavoring. And I think if we can do that and we are 100% family owned, we don't have external capital. If we can do that, then I think, you know, you can't not call on larger industries to start to, and larger companies to start to change their ingredient decks as well. What about sugar? What's your approach to sugar in your product? I think it's a balanced thing, isn't it? I think this this kind of bandwagon, which is so intrinsic in the culture that we have, which comes from a very long-standing diet culture, in my opinion, of I'm on a bandwagon, I'm off a bandwagon, I'm going to do something 100% or I'm not going to do it at all, is a is kind of a part of the problem. And I think sugar is often the first thing that people ask about in that sense. You know, I I think if what you're used to doing is having a sort of Mars bar, Twix, et cetera, every day. And you say, oh, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to have carrot sticks instead. It's probably not going to last. The two are quite different. So I don't think that you should be saying, I'm never going to have something sweet again, but it's, can you swap it for something with slightly better ingredients? Because you sell sweet things. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. And that's, that's very deliberate because, you know, people and want... They're, they're not good for you as such, are they? Well, they have they're very of... good ingredients. If you compare our ingredient deck to, for example, like our fruit and nut bars, they're filled with pumpkin seeds and almonds and oats. There's not a single ultra processed food in there in that sense. And then you look at the large companies' versions of the same thing, they'll add infinitely more ingredients or we make a chocolate spread that's 80% roasted nuts. Whereas obviously, if you look at a conventional chocolate spread, it's 56% sugar, we've got 5% sweetener. So it's a completely different way of approaching it. If you go into, you know, a, one of the large supermarkets, so in one of the large, in the big four where our oat bars sit, it's in a category of almost 100 bars. We are the only company in there that does not have an emulsifier, a preservative, a stabilizer or a flavoring across our whole range. We are the only company that are doing that. And that is something that I'm really, really why proud is that? of. I mean, what because is it that's different? It's more expensive. It's more expensive to produce them in that way and it's more difficult and it's less uniform. And I think because we are so used to kind of uniform flavours, you know, if you make, let's just say pesto at home, right? It would taste a little bit different every time, right? You know, the length um, of which you roast your pine nuts, the flavour of the pine nuts, the basil that day, depending, you know, the weather conditions, etc. It will change. Whereas, um, but if you use flavourings, it'll be the same every single time. And so do your oat bars cost more than everyone else's? No, they don't, which is a very deliberate strategy of ours to try and put them, which is why they're in the mainstream supermarkets. They're in like the kind of just above the middle range, for example, for those ones. Um, but our margin will undoubtedly is be less. smaller. Yeah. Right. So they're, they're, are they a loss leader or are they... No, no, we're a very profitable company. They're, they're which, profitable um, still, but just... But we, don't, but we don't have, for example, marketing budgets, et cetera. Like it's a very deliberate decision. We, we've just bought our own factory to bring um, much more manufacturing in-house to be able to do more. And again, to kind of really try and lead the way in showing you don't need to add these ingredients. Because obviously the big arguments around ultra-processed food is about cost and, and about what, what it would mean for the average family shop to take out ultra processing. Are, are you trying to say that if your oat bars aren't any more expensive than everybody else's, that you could effectively have a family shop that isn't more expensive than it is now? 
Well, I think, no, look, sometimes, you know, you can get, for example, if you look in like the frozen food aisle, like it can be extraordinarily cheap. And that is obviously a huge part of the challenge. But I think a lot of it comes from can you swap some of that for cooking at home? And, you know, there was a, something I read recently, it's 3.3 million people um, don't have access to somewhere that sells fruit and vegetables within 15 minutes on a public trans within public transport. And so, you know, it's so much more complicated than just saying, look, take this lentil bolognese, it can use really cheap ingredients, you can make a big batch of it, you can all eat it, it's good for you, it's full of fiber, etc. Because there's so many factors at play there in terms of at time, the cost now with energy prices going up of cooking, um, of the resources that allow people to feel like they can actually make things like that. But also, you know, ultimately, then we know this, you know, the way that we eat, it changes your palate. If you're used to ultra processed food, a strawberry a carrot that you're going to lose the sweetness of that they taste very 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 different and so it's so multifaceted but equally I think we do have to be really honest about the stark reality of our health in this country and how do we change it and how do we get people eating more plants and that's from an environmental perspective as well we know we need to reduce our meat intake by at least a third to have an impact and that's not going to happen if people think this food is bland, if people don't know how to cook this kind of food. And again, if we don't start to have it on the menus in schools, in hospitals and prisons and really making it something that is kind of on the government's agenda, which is, you know, firmly not. Right. But I mean, you come from you come from the Sainsbury family. Your mum's a Sainsbury. So you, you, you understand or you know people who understand that whole business. Do, do you think the supermarkets are exploiting us? Are they doing what they could do? Could they transform our lives and they're not? I think it's so much more complicated than that. I think everyone plays a role in it and I think supermarkets play a role in it as well. And, you know, trying to move around so that the fresh food is at the front, that we're helping people with that. But equally, yeah, if you walk into most supermarkets, the vast majority of what's sold in there is almost actively quite bad for us. And we know that now. And, and do you need to fundamentally shift that? But equally, if they all did that tomorrow, they'd go bust. So... It has to be this much more 360 approach. And obviously, you know, that that really starts with government and starts with government policies and it looks at subsidies. And, you know, do you have to start asking questions about, you know, having taxes on certain foods to make other foods cheaper? And, I, it, you know, I don't think the supermarkets can do it alone, but everybody has a role to play in it. Absolutely. And I guess that's where the recipe books come in, because ultimately, if you just preach at people, people all day, people roll their eyes. No one likes being told what to do. And instead, if we can kind of gently show you people at the same time that that does help. So when you look back at your original recipes, I mean, there's a hint of it in your introduction to this new book, you know, that we don't all have time to soak our chickpeas and to all of that. Do you think you were a bit naive about what ordinary lives were like? when you were 23? Yeah, look, I was 23, exactly. Like, I was living at home. I, you know, did not have anywhere near the kind of weight of responsibility with my career than I have now. I didn't have any children. You know, it, it is different, isn't it? And now with a very busy career and with two small kids, you know, the demands on you are obviously very different. And I definitely, I wish I'd catered to that more in the beginning. Now, um... A lot, a lot of sort of healthy eating stuff seems to be sort of wrapped up together now. Um, so gluten-free, dairy-free, um, plant-based. Does it all go in a pot together, so to speak, or are these all separate issues that we need to think about differently? I don't think they're all separate issues and it depends what it is. And I think part of, I think sometimes the frustration that I have with the wellness industry is that it makes it more complicated than it needs to be. Like ultimately what we're fundamentally talking about and trying to encourage people to do is eat less ultra processed food, cook more and use more simple fresh ingredients, you know, and not to be too kind of generalist, but like as their grandparents or great grandparents would have done it. It's almost just like going back to absolute basics. And I think one of the challenges that you have is obviously like these big debates and should, you know, the keto diet and these trends coming out of America and all these, yeah, gluten-free and dairy-free and all these different topics that you could talk about. Ultimately, like it just starts to muddy the water and it starts to make it quite confusing and people are reading a different headline every single day about something specific. And I understand why, because it's quite attention grabbing and it's quite interesting to read about. But equally, I think that the underlying message is just eat more simple real food ingredients and like if that's what everyone could take away that would be a win and whether you want to be 100% plant-based or a Mediterranean diet or 
all of the rest of it, ultimately, the thread is the same. It's, you know, any documentary you watch on the blue zones, et cetera, in the areas in the world where people live the longest, they're in different parts of the world, they're doing slightly different things, but there is a similar thread of they are cooking simple home-cooked meals with lots and lots of fruits and vegetables. So, so why are you having this sort of second thread, if you like, to um, wanting to change the world, if you like, and be, have a little campaigning element to what you're doing as well as the business? I mean, a, a cynic might say, oh, well, you're just, you're just trying to get people to buy your products. It's not that, is it? It's not, it's not as depressing as that. Honestly, uh, if it was, <laughs> we would have sold up a long time ago. <laughs> you know, um, that would have been the easy option, 100%. Like, definitely, definitely not. I feel so lucky. You know, not many people get the opportunity to make a difference to so many people's lives. And over the last 10 years, you know, we've spoken to millions and millions of people. And every single day I get messages from people saying how much it has helped them, how much it's changed their health, how what an impact that's had on their lives. And you, I think again, because of my personal experience of ill health and feeling like that, you can't help but have this drive to try and change the way that other people feel and once you start hearing story after story after story of doing it for people you think wow if we could kind of completely turbocharge this and do it for more and more people what an impact that has coupled with the fact that every single time you open the papers every single time you listen to the news at the moment there is more and more information about kind of how challenging our total health is in this country and what a pressure that's having on the nhs the projected um, costs over the next 5, 10, 15 years. You, you can't move but be confronted with the reality of it now. And I think one of the things that really dawned on me, especially over the last year, is, you know, for the last 10, 12 years, I've been publishing recipes, I've been talking about changing our diet, been, you know, showing on social media how easy it is, and that's been a really big part of it. And then we've always said, look, and we know you don't have time to make everything, so we'll make food products and we'll put a yogurt, we'll put veggie bites, we'll put pasta, we'll put pesto, we'll put snack bars on the shelf, which don't use these ingredients. But actually, I now feel, and I guess this is the second wave, it's so much more than that. You know, it's this idea that for so, you know, it's it's not necessarily anyone's individual fault that they eat the way they do and therefore they have the repercussions of that. It is the ecosystem that we live in and it's the fact that ultimately the vast majority of what you now see in shops is ultra processed food and it's almost still going against the status quo to eat well. And I feel that if we can, and it's taken us sort of six, seven years to do this, may go for 100 products that go across every category that can go in every supermarket and don't use these ingredients, there is absolutely no reason that other companies can't start to make the change. And if they start to make the change, the cost will come down as well. So, so putting your head above the parapet, um, you are inviting criticism and personal yes, attack 100%. these days, particularly because of the way your business grew on social media. And you've been through all of this before. Um, so what, what are you doing differently this time? I think I was 23 when my first book came out and I was just, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And I don't think I was confident enough, comfortable enough to, as you said, invite this criticism to have a really, what I feel is a really important debate about the way that we eat. And I think early on in my career, I was just, yeah, too nervous. And I feel now, and I think especially becoming a parent, my kids are three and four, I look at the landscape again of the way that we feed our children. And I know that is such a difficult conversation to have. Um, it really, really is. And, and parents are only doing their best. But equally, again, you just see the impact, as I said, that that ecosystem, that that landscape has, where every time you go into a shop, all you see is ultra processed sweets and it changes their palate and it makes them want that. And I think if that's what they start with, where do you end and how difficult it, it becomes to change your diet and to have this taste for, as I said, like carrots and potatoes and these sorts of ingredients. So I think it is, it's this kind of wider sense of mission now that I feel, and I think it's this yeah, becoming a parent, I feel, I guess, more responsibility, but also more comfortable to step into it and say, you know, I'm happy. I'm happy to have a personal attack if what it means is that we're getting out there and it makes a difference to someone's life. So, so how did people attack you initially? It's all things relative. I think you when, when I read about particularly other women's um, experience in the public eye, it's infinitely more difficult than I have had it, absolutely. Um, but there is this, and it's the strange thing I think that sometimes happens in the UK is like when it gets quite vitriolic and kind of deeply personal in a way that has nothing to do with the subject matter at hand. 
And I think there was a very big part of that. And I totally understand, you know, you brought it up earlier. Obviously, I've had a privileged upbringing and, you know, I was a young girl and I was saying, you know, do it like me. And I think that really rubbed a lot of people up the wrong way. And and I, I understand why I, I genuinely really do. And how, how did that change the way you were behaving? I felt I just needed to kind of pull back and sort of slightly disappear. Um, and actually, it was really... And then, and then I had my two kids and, it, and the business kept growing and, and what we were doing did keep very much growing, but it was really kind of coming out of the back of COVID and thinking, okay, what's, what's next? Coming back from, from maternity with, with the girls and thinking, okay, this is really a choice now. Like we can become a really faceless commercial business or we can really step forward and say, okay, the world is increasingly catching up to, as I said, this link between what we eat and our health. Um, people are so much more receptive to this conversation around ultra processed food and we have the opportunity to genuinely make a change and how many people have the platform to do that. I am so lucky. And I know what an impact it's had on so many people like to throw that away because you're scared that someone doesn't like you just seems like something you would regret every day for the rest of your life. So what, what's your approach then to sort of how much you reveal? I mean, because if, if the whole deliciously other thing began because you revealed this very, very difficult period of your life. And, you know, you've talked in great detail about depression and, um, and, and, you know, the physical side of your illness. If you then sort of retreat and say, well, I'm, you know, I'm not going to talk about me anymore. Um, does that work? No, no, it, <laughs> it didn't work. It really didn't work. Um, and it stopped, yeah, it felt like it had lost uh, an element of soul to so, it. So is this you sort of coming out again and saying, yeah, fine, I'll be me again? And yeah, totally, but I guess you know? like, you know, 2.0, for one to, like I just yeah. feel, I, d I just don't mind, like I don't mind. If you want to disagree with me and if you want to tell me that what we eat doesn't matter at all and it's absolutely fine to eat ultra processed food all day long and you just don't want to hear it, we're going to respectively very much disagree with each other on that. And um, and that is fine. I am now very happy to have that conversation. I'm very, very, very happy for you to hate me for saying to you I fundamentally disagree. Really? Yeah. I wish when I was younger I had had more confidence to stand up and say, you know, say no, essentially, and highlight any elements of the misogyny, of the fact that all the criticism focused solely on young women, never about men. It was so often so misrepresentative. And now I I read it and I genuinely, I'm like almost surprised I don't feel personally upset by it, which is why I now feel comfortable, I guess, to take a, a stronger stance. When you say there's so much misogyny in the attacks on you, what do you mean and why, why are you so sure it's misogyny rather than just ordinary disagreement hate. <laughs> yeah, just good old hate well i think you know if i look back on the kind of crux of of criticism i received it was yeah sort of a few years into my career and it was when people were saying wait a second health eating had kind of exploded this is sort of 2015 to sort of 2018 and out of nowhere suddenly there were all these books about changing your diet all these recipes everywhere everyone talking about courgettes and all the rest of it and, and I completely understand that there were people, as I said, that were saying, stop telling me what to do. These young people go away. Let me live my life. Um, and so there was a sort of a mounting of conversation and criticism of this new wave of healthy eating and this encouragement of it, which, again, look back and I think, God, this is so weird. If I had created a business around baking that was all around chocolate cakes, I don't think I ever would have had any of the criticism. Whereas when you're trying to encourage people and give people resources to eat more healthily, you have this attack, which I, I still find so bizarre again when I look about a look at the way that we collectively eat and how much we need to change that. The idea that we're so critical of it seems bizarre. But it was only women that were essentially included in it. And it was all this undercurrent of like silly young girls, you know, talking heads of someone else's marketing campaign. I mean, it's really interesting what you say that, you know, had, had you been a sort of a pro sweet treats writer, yeah. you wouldn't have got you wouldn't have got those attacks. I mean, you know, do, do you think culturally, you know, given you're talking about the whole ecosystem in which we live, you know, are things like Bake Off really bad? No, <laughs> no, not at all. Like everything has its place and there is nothing but wrong you, but, with but baking a is... chocolate cake. But do we also need to show people how to 
make a, a simple veggie packed yeah. meal. Yes, and that is and that is but exactly is the culture my frustration. of cake every day in the office good or bad? I think it is probably bad, and that's not to say. And this is where, like, I want to hit my head against the wall to some extent. Or frustration, where people take that out of context and they'll take the soundbite where I'm saying cake in the office is bad. What I'm saying is that we have created a culture where that is cake. There's, you know, there's the cake in the office, and it just adds up and it adds up and it adds up and it adds up. If what you were doing was then the rest of the day having healthy food and having lots of vegetables and you know healthy proteins and fats and all the rest of it. There's nothing wrong with having that cake. It's not this all or nothing approach. But I think when I say no, I think the problem is, is that the culture has just seeped in more and more and more. So it's like, you know, it's your meal deal at lunch, it's your cake in the office, it's your takeaway for dinner. And you start to look at it and you're like, yes, you know, the vast majority of what I've eaten is from largely empty calories. And so that is where the problem comes in, not in having one piece of cake. And I think that is the confusion that happens so often. And that's also doesn't help people make a change to the way that they eat, thinking that it has to be this very binary all or nothing. I mean, you said changing the ecosystem has to begin with government. So, so what, I mean, what could government do? You talked about taxing things. What do you mean? Because the only tax that most people have heard of will be the tax on sugar. Exactly. But that was, you know, the, like what we looked at in, in the drink, it was, it was pretty effective. I think, I mean, I think there's two parts. I think you have to have transparency. And I think part of the problem is, is that we're, and largely, and I was as well, unaware of what is actually in our food and what those ingredients do. So I think there has to be some level of whether it's labeling, whether it's signposting, but actually creating infinitely more clarity for people. And I think that is probably legislative comes from legislation so you start to understand the sorts of ingredients that are in the things that you're buying just in the way that calories have been added and I don't know if that's the most helpful way of doing it because you know you can have the same number of calories and it can be really good for you or not at all but there has to be I think a a level of transparency so you start to understand what it is and I think in that people start to make their own choices but do you have to start to look at it where you're you know you're adding more VAT you're adding more tax to these ingredients that are really bad for you so that you you are starting to change it so that you don't have what you currently have, where generally speaking, the cheapest food is the food that is the least healthy. So the aim is that is that government policy would force reformulation. I think it? I think it has to ultimately, but it also has to come hand in hand with infinitely more education, cooking in schools, helping people actually understand the link between their food choices and their health. And I think that is something that we still feel so far away from. But it also has to make getting fruit and vegetables more accessible. It has to make them more available to more people. And um, and we somehow have to try and make them more affordable. I mean, because all, all, all of this always leads to an argument about the nanny state. Well, that, and, that's and what you're thing. saying is the nanny state is what we need. I think an element of it is what we are going to have to have um, because ultimately what we're currently doing isn't working. And... There's no two ways around that. You know, we saw that if you take... We are like useless children who can't look after ourselves. No, and I think this is actually... I think the point is it's actually not that. I think this idea is is that it's actually not the individual. It's actually the the setting that we're in. And, you know, the how difficult it is to make healthy choices when everything you're confronted with is really bad for you. So it's, I'm not saying that at all. I, I don't think so much of it. Whilst there is more that's in our power, so much isn't about the individual. But you do want a lot of regulation by the sound of it. You, you, you want regulation to change the environment in which we live. I think, I think there's no other way of doing it at this point. I mean, you, you've grown up with politics as well. Your dad was a politician. Yeah. Conservative and Labour. Yeah. Or Conservative <laughs> then Labour. Um, Sean Woodward. Um, so, so, I mean, what have you learned from him and being around that world about how realistic your political dream is? Oh, it's incredibly difficult. Like my, my mother-in-law was a, a politician as well. I feel like I've, I've really absorbed so much of it and how challenging it is. And I, you know, a lot of these policies won't be popular. And I'm not trying to say it's straightforward by any means, but when you look at the state of our health, the cost that it has, the way that it is impacting people's lives, it feels like drastic action is needed at some point. And this sort of 
gently, gently, gently approach. We won't tell people what to do. We did tell people how bad smoking was. We did, you know, put cigarettes behind the counter. We did put harmful messages and, you know, on the front of packets. And it has had a really positive impact. And that was deeply unpopular, obviously, as that sort of um, change start to, it started to come in and it was resisted heavily for a very, very long time. I think if we sat down 20 years from today, I think that with you know, the levels of ultra processed food that are on the shelf today, I think that we would see the same thing that we've seen with smoking. There will be a tipping point, at which point as a country, we cannot afford to keep going the way that we're doing, the, the way that we're currently going, something will have to shift. I mean, did you see you, you know, entering politics at any time or your your husband, your, your, your business partner, Matthew, yeah. who you mentioned the son of Tessa Jell, former Labour politician. Um, I mean, do, could that be the next stage in your in your careers? I don't think it is for me, although I would love to have a more, yeah, advocacy approach. And I would I would love to, that. that's what I would like to do next. And having kind of got the business to the point it is now, I would like to, to really step out of the day to day to some extent and really step forward in terms of really trying to implement change to the way that we eat and bring a lot more education um, to the forefront. But uh, he is more interested in going into politics, certainly than I am in terms of like being a being a politician, whereas I think I can probably Im impact more change from I mean, it's what very I'm doing today. Isn't it? is, the, is, is the truth, you know, the idea of public service and politics in that way, because with politics, politicians have never had a worse reputation, but I get, you're sort of kicking against that a little bit in what you're saying, that you're saying you need to get involved. Yeah, I think he feels quite a deep calling to get involved. I don't know why, whether he actually will in the long run, but he definitely feels that pretty deep calling. Um, and I think growing up with his mum, she had such extraordinary values and felt so passionately about the amount of change that politicians could have. And I think he definitely carries that with him very much. Um, but I think from where from where I sit, I think I can probably have a bigger impact where I am today. And well, in that case, can I, we sort of skirted around it a bit. But I mean, we talked about the sort of the privilege that you've you've grown up with. You know, is there a danger? Do you think that we end up in a world in which the only people who can really kind of do the things that you're doing, advocacy, business? talking about politics and political change, are, are people of privilege? You know, that, that you've had that sort of luxury, if you like, of sort of being able to fall back on the privilege in your life that now gives you that this sort of springboard with which to maybe do good things. What, so if our business goes bust, you're, do, do you mean as in you're able to do that because if you're- I, Well, I suppose you've, you know, you haven't had the fear, have you, I suppose? Oh my fear. gosh, I've had the fear. Have you? Oh my, I mean, we've had a, a personal guarantee against our house for eight years. Like we took out a five million pound loan in the peak of COVID to buy our investors out. Personal guarantee against our house, interest rents, interest rates go through the roof. Like it is terrifying. And you, you know, yes, I had a privileged background. Absolutely. Um, but no one gives you a business. Like no one creates a hundred jobs for you. No one does that. And I think it's, and when you start a business, you risk so much. You pour everything into it. It is our whole life. We have nothing outside of it. And yeah, as I said, we had a personal guarantee against our house for eight years. It was finally lifted last summer once we'd got um, far enough into repaying the loan that we'd taken out. But you, you know, it's full of risk. And I'm not saying that, um, I'm not denying any privilege in my background, but I think, I don't think that's what's created our business and like absolutely if we get, went bust our whole family could move in with my parents with my mum or with my dad I'm not sure how much they'd love it um but you know but that's as that's as far as we're going and I think um and as I said it's not to deny privilege but I think sometimes privilege is often also used as a weapon and Again, that's something I found very difficult to to deal with early on in my career. And whenever someone would mention Sainsbury's, I would feel really embarrassed. And I think it's taken 10 years. It's taken owning a factory, owning a restaurant, employing 100 people, getting to, you know, over 20 million pounds of revenue to almost have as like evidence to say, oh, no, we created this. And I mean, this whole interview has been about change. But if you could 
wave a magic wand and change the world, how would you change it? I'd almost want to reverse our food system. I wish we could go back 50 to 60 years where it was still the norm to eat simple everyday food where people didn't struggle so much with them. We didn't live in this ecosystem which really is pitted against people making healthy choices. I think that's the thing I would do and I would try and make, yeah, it would be to wave a magic wand and make it easy for people because that is something that I wish, I think that, you know, you were said earlier on in my career, you know, did I get it? I think that is the bit that I didn't because I was so passionate about it and I was so passionate about cooking everything from scratch and doing it all. I think I lost sight of how difficult it is to make those choices when you walk in every single day, you're busy, you don't have much time, you don't have all the resources and you look at it and making those healthy choices is currently almost impossible. And so that is what I would do, I would wave magic wand and the food landscape would change and it would be where the vast majority of what is sold everywhere is simple, fresh, whole food ingredients. Ellen Mills, thank you very much indeed.